So I am going to give uh, a basic foundation of how we came to where we are right now. And uh, then my other friends on the committee will talk. Uh, I want to let you know, all, everyone here, that we, Green Street Reparations, uh, we are not going to come to your meetings and uh, tell you uh, what we did. We are not going to talk this to death. And we, uh, so we are here today to share this information about what we did, how we got started, how we went on this road, uh, you know, this path. And, and where we are now. Um, and then hopefully that is something that you can share in your meetings and your quarters and, and, and hit the ground running, do something with it. So in the beginning, uh, what happened was uh, Green Street meeting, like many meetings across Philadelphia yearly meeting uh, is old. Um, and we were having problems. Our basement was getting flooded, our heat kept breaking, our uh, meeting house was leaking, the actual inside of meeting, the walls were changing colors. Uh, we, it was, our meeting house was in bad shape. And so we said, okay, we, we have to do some repairs because this is just crazy. And we had a, um, a contractor come out and look at the building for all the things that were broken that we, we were in there when it was freezing and there was no heat, all these different things. We had a contractor come out and uh, they gave us uh, a number to fix everything, to redo the meeting. And it was hundreds of thousands of dollars. It was a lot of money. And the members of the meeting were like, oh my gosh, oh, what do we do? How do we fix our meeting house? How do we fix the heat? How do we stop it from flooding and all these things that are wrong with it? how do we get this money? And, you know, someone on trustees, someone who uh, knew the meeting's finances said, well, we could just pay it. And a bunch of us were like, just pay it. So you mean that we have money? Like the, the meeting has money? And they were like, yes, we, we can just pay it. And we were kind of, many members of the meeting were a little bit blown away by that. Like we had no idea that the meeting had money. We go to meeting, we're in our spiritual community, we're doing um, our work, we're on our committees and we're not thinking about, I didn't think about it, honestly, I did not know how much money Green Street had. So once the meeting as a whole, all the uh, members and attenders who were there realized how much money Green Street had, our next thought was, well, what are we doing with that money? What are we doing in our community? What are our good works out in, our, in the world? And so we were a little bit, we almost felt bad. We had money, we didn't realize that we had it. And now we're thinking we should be doing something way more than what we're doing. So we embarked on this journey and this was 2008. 18, 2017, it was a while ago. And we did something called the spirituality of money where a member, um, Lola of, of meeting, um, she took us through a workshop. It was like six months, um, one Saturday, I think a month, something like that. But so we would spend time together talking about money, talking about what money means and um, who has it, who doesn't have it? What, what does it mean when you don't have it? What does it mean to, and so all of these different things around money, money as covenant, money as a promise. And so at the end of that time, as a whole, as, as a body, as, as a meeting, we started, we together saw money differently, understood having money different than before we took this workshop. And then, Reparations Working Group was created. And Reparations Working Group, we said, okay, the meeting is ready now for us to come up with ways to use this money, with things to do. And, um, and, and, and so then we started trying to figure out what do we do, right? How do we go about uh, making these changes? What do we do? And I want to say that, you know, at Green Street, we are a meeting that is growing. And I know for many meetings across the yearly meeting, that is a problem. They're not getting more members, more attenders, 
and they don't have families and they don't have young people. And so as you listen to the rest of our presentation, I want you to think about how the people who were already at Green Street made changes and choices and decisions that welcomed more people into Green Street, different people, young people, black people, uh, BIPOC people and um, families. Uh, because I feel like this is a problem across the yearly meeting. And I, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Quakerism is appealing to many, many different types of people, old and young, straight and gay, all kinds of people are, are uh, uh, um, attracted to Quakerism. Quakers are not appealing to a lot of people. And I want you to sit with that. I want you to think about that because many, a lot of the problem that we have in Philadelphia yearly meeting is not Quakerism. That's the problem. So I've given you the foundation of how we got to the beginning of reparations. And now I think Epchez is going to uh, take us further. Thanks, Gabrielle. Um, yeah, so as Gabrielle set up, we were at this place where we had started the reparations committee, right? So <laughs> we were looking around at each other. What, what are we going to actually do as this group of people um, with this name, reparations, um, that there's a lot of different understandings of what this word means. We started talking in the meeting, meeting with other people in our meeting about what reparations means. We started having conversations with local nonprofits and community organizations who might be interested in like doing a project with funds that we could provide. But we had this, you know, chicken and egg, cart and horse kind of feedback loop. No one was, you know, wanted to sign up to do a project with us when we couldn't say this is how much money we have available for something. Um, and no one at the meeting wanted to give out money when we didn't know this is the exact thing that we're going to do with it. And this is the way it will be affected. And this is how it is like a direct redress of repair for something. Um, so our thinking around this transformed really in 2020. Um, we had sort of gone on a bit of a hiatus after the disheartening experience of coming with proposals, getting sent away, coming with proposals, getting sent away, asking people <laughs> what they would want to do and feeling like we couldn't further those relationships um, in good faith because we didn't know if we would have the money support behind it. So we came back with clarity in 2020 that it does not matter what you know who exactly we might owe repairs to reparation to for exactly what the fact of the matter is green street's money comes from the be benefit of white members of the meeting who have hoarded wealth in this location and it doesn't actually matter exactly where it came from exactly who was oppressed to create that capital wealth anyone in our neighborhood who is suffering who is a black person suffering from economic disparity is owed and we as a meeting who has benefited from the privilege of being able to hoard money in this way and being able to accrue wealth we owe and so it became very clear um, that that this was something we wanted to do doesn't matter who owes what for what exactly we owe and our neighbors are owed so let's do something um lucy is gonna uh talk a little bit about some of the deeper work that we did looking at reparations, what it means, and also share a video that also lays out this principle really, really clearly. Thanks, Epchez. Thank you, Gabrielle. Um, it's great to be with you all um, and to be talking about this. Um, the, the 
um, in order to get the meeting ready to commit to reparations, I mean, that I think is a really big thing. Um, and there were like Gabrielle and Epchez have, have said some of the things that we did. It's important to also recognize that we as a meeting have been having conversations about racism really intentionally, at least since 2014, monthly conversations, very deep conversations and like trying to grapple with that. And that's part of the preparation. Um, when the reparations committee got clear that we wanted to make a request to have a commitment to reparations, we're like, okay, how do we get the meeting ready for, for that ask? And so 12 people um, engaged in, um, in a course by the grassroots reparations campaign. Now I'm, I work for the same, those same people now, um, and um, which is a really intensive five session five week that really introduces people to the concept of reparations, both spiritually and materially. And some of the people who took that course were more central institutionally to Green Street. And so they were people that folks would really listen to and they were very committed and very like moved by the course. And um, some of them joined our reparations committee at that time. Um, and then, um, we actually were, had an invitation from the clerk to come and present and present a real proposal. And so we're like, well, we first need to get the meeting ready. We need to get the business meeting really ready to receive this. So the first thing that we did was Epchez and I presented on what is reparations? What does it mean? Um, and so we, we presented the definition of reparations, which I'm going to briefly tell you. Um, and I think that the multi-dimensions of reparations are really in key, important to keep in mind that it's not just writing a check. It's about much, it's, it's, that's one step, but that's, it's much deeper. It's not charity. It's very different from that. It's around re relational repair. Um, the, the grassroots reparations campaign says that reparations is the midpoint between truth and reconciliation. And Reverend Naomi, whom I get to work with in the um, Mayor's Commission says that you can't have a relationship, you can't repair a relationship if you don't have a relationship already. So reparations is a vehicle for that. So reparations is a process of repairing, healing, and restoring a people injured because of their group identity in violation of their fundamental human rights by governments, corporations, institutions, and families, which is which points to some of the like possibility of reparations. We don't have to wait for, uh, we want HR 40 to pass. We don't have to wait for that. We can do it ourselves. We can do this family by family, Quaker meeting by Quaker meeting. And there are five formal categories. There's restitution, which is restore those that have been harmed, the victims to the original situation before the gross violations. There is uh, damages compensation, which is what people often think about. It's actually paying, assessing, and paying reparations, direct reparations. Rehabilitation, which is psych psychological support, social services, re um, re recovering and healing from the abuse. Satisfaction, which is really the cessation of the abuse and really satisfaction of the commitment to not cause the harm again. It includes truth-seeking, a reburial, public apologies, those kinds of things. And then the guarantee of non-repetition, which is really, really important in terms of the transformation. So pretension, prevention of future abuses. So we presented the, that definition and then we shared the video that we're gonna share with you right now, um, which is really a case for reparations. Um, it, this is a, this is, um, a, uh, a message, it feels to me like inspired ministry from Miss Kimberly Jones after the George Floyd murder in Minneapolis and her speaking to the question of economic devastation, multi-generational devastation to the black community. So Zach, if you can share that, that would be great. So I've, I've been seeing a lot of things talking of the people making commentary. Um, Interestingly enough, the ones I've noticed that have been making the commentary are wealthy black people making the commentary about we should not be um, rioting, we should not be looting, we should not be tearing up our own communities. And then there's been an argument of the other side of we should be hitting them in the pocket. We should be focusing on the blackout days where we don't spend money. Um, but, you know, I feel like we should do both. And I feel like I support both. And I'll tell you why I support both. 
I support both because there, when you have a civil unrest like this, there are three type of people in the streets. There are the protesters, there are the rioters, and there are the looters. The protesters are there because they actually care about what is happening in the community. They want to raise their voices and they are there strictly to protest. You have the rioters who are angry, who are anarchists, who really just want to shit up. And that's what they're going to do regardless. And then you have the looters. And the looters almost exclusively are just there to do that, to loot. Now, people are like, well, what did you gain? Well, what did you get from looting? I think that as long as we're focusing on the what, we're not focusing on the why. And that's my issue with that. As long as we're focusing on what they're doing, we're not focusing on why they're doing. And some people are like, well, those aren't people who are legitimately angry about what's happening. Those are people who just want to get stuff. Okay, well then, let's go with that. Let's say that's what it is. Let's ask ourselves why in this country, in 2020, the financial gap between poor blacks and the rest of the world is at such a distance that people feel like their only hope and only opportunity to get some of the things that we flaunt and flash in front of them all the time is to walk through a broken glass window and get it. That they are so hopeless that getting that necklace, getting that TV, getting that change, getting that bed, getting that phone, whatever it is that they're going to get is that in that moment when the riots happen and if they present an opportunity of looting that's their only opportunity to get it we need to be questioning that why why are people that poor why are people that broke why are people that that food insecure that clothing insecure that they feel like their only shot that they are shooting their shot by walking through a broken glass window to get what they need. And then people want to talk about, well, there's plenty of people who pulled themselves up by their bootstraps and got it on their own. Why can't they do that? Let me explain to you something about economics in America. And I'm so glad that as a child, I got an opportunity to spend time at PUSH where they taught me this, is that we must never forget that economics was the reason that black people were brought to this country. We came to do the agricultural work in the South and the textile work in the north do you understand that that's what we came to do we came to do the agricultural work in the south and the textile work in the north now if I right now if I right now decided that I wanted to play Monopoly with you and for 400 rounds of playing Monopoly I didn't allow you to have any money I didn't allow you to have anything on the board I didn't allow for you to have anything and then we played another 50 rounds of Monopoly and everything that you gained and you earned while you were playing that round of Monopoly was taken from you that was Tulsa that was Rosewood there are pla those are places where we built black economic wealth where we were self-sufficient where we owned our stores where we owned our property and they burned them to the ground so that's 450 years so for 400 rounds of monopoly you don't get to play at all not only do you not get to play you have to play on the behalf of the person that you're playing against you have to play and make money and earn wealth for them and then you have to turn it over to them so then for 50 years, you finally get a little bit and you're allowed to play. And every time that they don't like the way that you're playing or that you're catching up or that you're doing something to be self-sufficient, they burn your game. They burn your cards. They burn your Monopoly money. And then finally at the release and the onset of that, they allow you to play and they say, okay, now you catch up. Now at this point, the only way you're going to catch up in the game is if the person shares the wealth, correct? But what if every time you share the wealth, then there's psychological warfare against you to say, oh, you're an equal opportunity higher. So if I played 400 rounds of Monopoly with you and I had to play and give you every dime that I made, and then for 50 years, every time that I played, I, if you didn't like what I did, you got to burn it like they did in Tulsa and like they did in Rosewood. How can you win? How can you win? You can't win. The game is fixed. So when they say, why do you burn down the community? Why do you burn down your own neighborhood? It's not ours. We don't own anything. We don't own anything. There is, Trevor Noah said it so beautifully last night. There's a social contract that we all have. That if you steal or if I steal, then the person who is the authority comes in and they fix the situation. But the person who fixes the situation is killing us. So the social contract is broken. 
And if the social contract is broken, why the f do I give a shit about burning the football hall of fame, about burning a fucking target? You broke the contract when you killed us in the streets and didn't give up. You broke the contract when for 400 years we played your game and built your wealth. You broke the contract when we built our wealth again on our own by our bootstraps in Tulsa and you dropped bombs on us. When we built it in Rosewood and you came in and you slaughtered us. You broke the contract, so your target. Your Hall of Fame. As far as I'm concerned, they could burn this bitch to the ground. And it still wouldn't be enough. And they are lucky that what black people are looking for is equality and not revenge. Thanks, Zachary. Um, I want you just to take that in like for a minute. And then Epchez is going to talk about what it means to budget reparations and some of the other things that we said. That's the truth, right? That's what we all know to be true. So can we start living like it's true? Is that something that we can do together as a community? Um, So one of the tools that I've started using in my personal life um, and that I brought to the, the meeting in the context of our uh, inherited wealth, because just the realization that our, our meeting is kind of a bit of a trust fund kid and there's something that we can do about that, right? Um, budgeting for reparations, it can be a lot about a lot of things, but there's a simple formula that um, was getting passed around on, on social media, on Instagram in 2020. And- um, Can you hear me? Yes. So Jim Collins just called. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. So the, the budgeting formula is very simple. Just figure out your monthly budget and gain an understanding of what, what are, what, what is your sort of surplus at, at the end of the month? Like bills can, bills are paid for. Everything is under control. Um, and after that, 50% of what you have left should be given in reparations, really returned in reparations to, to black community. Um, and this, this is still a, a budgeting tool that is really protecting comfort in a lot of ways, if we're completely honest, right? It's very generous, I would say. Um, and so it's, 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 it's the starting place, right? Um, everyone's finances are different, but that basic principle is what we, as the reparations committee took to the body of Green Street um, to consider when we were trying to bring a proposal forward for what financially this could look like. Me and Lucy looked at the budget of Green Street from 2019 and the number that we felt would be a reasonable ask would be $50,000 each year for the next 10 years as um, as funds that would be going towards repairing the, honestly, we're working on the, the relationship is a little bit, it's part, it's all tied up together, but it's its own thing. But the funds are to 
protect and support black wealth in our neighborhood, right? Um, so it's a total of $500,000. That's what we're able to commit to at Green Street. Um, and the each year, the black members and attenders of the meeting are meeting and deciding how the funds are distributed. Um, this year, we've taken on a legal clinic. Um, this legal clinic is specifically for black homeowners in our neighborhood. And the purpose is to make it free for them to protect the wealth, their existing wealth for future generations. Um, so that was the proposal that the came from the meeting of the black members and attenders that we've been rallying around and organizing to bring together. Um, so yeah, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna go into depth about how that is going, but it's in process, it's happening. Um, we've, we've been able to start, yeah, meeting a lot of neighbors through this and um, it's, it's already been a, a really wonderful on many lever levels um, projects just this one year. And we're excited to be able to keep doing this work and whatever it um, becomes in the future. Um, so we're moving towards the end of our time. Um, and just wanted to bring a reminder for friends here today that Quakers, especially in this yearly meeting, um, because Quakers were the white people who came here and were the first big landowners um, in this region and big industry owners in this region and made a lot of money in this region in particular. Um, and in those early years, made a lot of money in, with enslaved labor, with black people who they owned, okay? Be very clear about this. Um, William Penn was the first enslaver and slave trader in Pennsylvania. So another fact, um, we like to think that Quakers signed on to the Germantown Declaration that opposed slavery. Um, I don't know the date for that. If someone does, that would be helpful to put in the chat. Um, but we did not. There were too many friends at that time who were so invested, 1688, according to a friend in the chat. There were so many friends in 1688 who were too invested in the institutions of slavery economically to be able to prioritize the truth of the value of Black humanity, the value of those Black human lives, right? Other things, um, Philadelphia Yearly Meeting was asked in the 60s for reparations, um, but, and that was, you know, because um, the, the organization working on that thought Quakers would be an easy win, you know, um, but we turned down that opportunity to make repair. And that was um, the, the local in Cobra um, at the time in, in, in the 60s asked for reparations from various religious organizations, white congregations, and um, Quakers refused. The National Coalition for Black Reparations in America. Um, 
it's time to make things right. It's been a long time. Philadelphia yearly meeting could have done something and at, at any point and hasn't. Um, in the 60s, yep. when they were asked in 1975, um, Philadelphia yearly meeting has caused deep harm in recent years. Um, and repair is owed. Lucy, did you want to speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, yeah, the some of the some of the harm caused, um, you know, you have two clerks of the undoing racism group who have ha on that are presenting today two former clerks, and that in that process, um, as many people know, we were pretty marginalized in the process when we when we asked for institutional power, we were pretty marginalized. Um, and then also there's been some um, harm that has been caused by former black staff of the of the yearly meeting. So uh, um, Muriel Thomas and Miel. Um, and so there's there's this there's this debt that's also owed. Um, and you know it's it's you know it's hard to say these things, but I think that that the the first step to reparations is telling the truth. And as the Religious Society of Friends um, of Truth, <laughs> it's really, really important that we, we be able to look at that. And um, I put in the chat um, a Quaker call to abolition and creation, which is an um, article I wrote in Friends Journal about our complicity with slavery and the creation of the penitentiary system. Um, and, and obviously there's a lot of, we, we're also complicit with the boarding schools, the um, Indian boarding schools. So it's really important that we look at ourselves, not and not to invoke shame or guilt, but to invoke the potential for our spiritual transformation and to do the transgenerational work of telling our truth and then doing what, what that calls us to. And, that, and I have found personally that the work on the reparations committee and the work of reparations that I'm doing, I'm doing my own genealogical research and I do have slaveholders in my family and, and that, and it's a huge debt. It's a huge thing to, it's to, to say, okay, how do I, how do I deal with the generational um, propping up of my family in a way that actually is leaning into offering repair. And so um, the truth, the truth is going, I believe the truth will set us free and doing re repair on behalf of that truth as we understand it is, is a deeply spiritual process. And it, in, it is, and we don't have to wait. We don't have to wait. And that's what Green Street did. We were like, we can do this. We can do this work. And I'm going to close by one of the things that we did in the in the session where we talked about um, um, invited the meeting into this sort of really wonderful, invigorating process of doing rep reparations and connecting and and doing this work in the community. And what we're doing is really reparative justice. We wanted people to think about the patterns of whiteness that are that that keep us from leaning into the spiritual call, um, and I just want to name a couple of those. Um, well, just I'll start by saying we white folks have a lot of defenses when deeper anti-racism initiatives are proposed, especially those that require us to take some risks or state step out of our sense of comfort. In a conversation about funding reparations, it is quite likely some of these patterns will emerge. They will, they did, they will. And, and as you all do this work we in, and consider it, we encourage you to watch for them in yourselves and others. And when you notice them, identify them. We wanna be spirit led in our discernment. And sometimes when these emerge in a conversation about structural racism or taking action to shift it, they might feel like spirit talking, but we ask you to reach beyond your discomfort and strive for the deeper sensing of the spirit beneath these common patterns. Um, of white resistance to deeper anti-racist change. That said, open consideration of dissent is the hallmark of Quaker process and we should be encouraged and welcomed and just seek to discern from whence your dissent arises. And I'm just gonna name a couple of the patterns. We white people offer resources to white folks more easily than we do to black indigenous people of color without checking it. We hold perceptions that black folks have problems handling money. We white people have a sense of a right to comfort. 
white people are often paternalistic and we try to hoard power and a deep pattern of whiteness is the need to control to be the helper and thereby to control resources or the way a resource is distributed. This opportunity asks of we white people to confront this pattern and learn to lean into trust and let go. And we also, we act like any marginalized person is the same. And we really, really, we want to invite you to focus on black reparations. We are focused on black reparations because of our particular call and our particular relationship with the black community. And that's why we're focusing on that here. And I don't wanna in any way say we want we're, things people need to compete against each other, but we wanna be really explicit about what is, is we're, we're, Screen Street is in a black community. Philadelphia Yearly Meeting is in a majority black city and we need to be really changing our relationship with the black community. Thank you. Gabrielle Epchez Lucy, thank you so much. Let's settle a little bit, friends. <laughs> <laughs>